G'day humans, welcome to the safe space for dangerous ideas. Here's a dangerous idea for you. What if, when we think about Jews, our brains kind of break a little? There are a few jigsaw pieces that don't fit together. There are enough cognitive dissonances that our intuitions lead us astray. Like, how do you feel when you hear the word Jew? Or when you hear the word a Jewish person? Does that have a different valence? Do you think a, a victimized person, a successful person, a manipulative person, a money-hungry person, a virtuous person? David Baddiel is one of Britain's most successful uh, stand-up comics and comedy writers, and has recently embraced his position as a proud Jew and wrote a book that has completely changed the way that I think about social justice, identity, and Jewishness. It's rare that I read a book where several times during the reading I think, wow, I'm my eyes are literally opened. I just have not heard this perspective, this point of view, put this way. In all of the opinions that I ingest from all of the rest of contemporary culture, it's a rare gift to be able to point out new ideas to people, and David has that gift. I, I want to say as a preface to this conversation, this is not about Gaza. This is not about Israel. This is not about the current conflagration in the Middle East. Uh, this interview was scheduled before uh, the tragedy of October 7th. Um, David regards his ideas as being deeply independent from and discreet from the woes of that misbegotten part of the world. He's talking about Western culture. He's talking about British Jews primarily, but there's a, an analogue in Australia and the United States, of course. So if you feel like, well, why aren't we talking more about Gaza and babies or about the massacre of October 7th, um, whilst this conversation takes place after those events, I wanted to remain true to what I was originally curious about with David, which is his analysis of the modern left and the modern right's attitude towards uh, Jewishness. Um, so take that uh, take that as a, as a as a sort of caveat umbrella over the conversation. David um, was uh, sort of credited in the '90s as being one of the British comics who turned comedy into the new rock and roll. They would say he created hit television shows, The Mary Whitehouse Experience. Newman and Badil in pieces with his double act uh, partner, and the two of them performed at Wembley Arena, like we're talking stadium shows, just the two of them. It was the UK's first ever arena comedy show. He subsequently made documentaries. He's written nine hugely successful children's books. He's written four adult novels. He's appeared on smash hit British shows like Little Britain, Skins, Eight Out of Ten Cats, QI. His latest book, also has a television documentary accompanying it. It's called Jews Don't Count. The book is amazing. I have yet to see the documentary, but if you're in Australia, you can see it on SBS On Demand. Please enjoy this conversation with the one and only David Badia. I loved the book. And after meeting you, I, I, I devoured the book. It really gave me some new insights. It's a weird time to be talking about this, since you didn't write the book in a climate like the one we now find ourselves in with regards well, to Well, I wrote Jews. it... As a Jews don't count. Yes. I, I wrote it... Um, there's a coda in the book, which is the moment at which um, Jeremy Corbyn got suspended from the Labour Party on the day that the uh, e ECHR, whatever it's called, there was a report by a big uh, human rights commission on the Labour Party which found that they had been, uh, you know, their duty of care towards their Jewish members had not been up to scratch. Uh, he refused to accept the findings of the report and as a result was suspended from the Labour Party. So I was writing at a time of, uh, you know, where suddenly anti-Semitism was certainly in the political headlines, was certainly a live issue in the way that it hadn't been uh, for a long time. But it's almost like since then, you know, it's more. It's like every time, uh, you know, you think that at some point this tiny minority is not going to be in the crossfires of history. It's not going to be central to some massive 
you know, either global or domestic political issue. But it, it, no, it doesn't seem to be stopping anytime soon. It just seems to be more of a thing. So Could I other think I minorities say the same thing, David? Could Muslims say, it just seems like no matter where we turn, there's always something, some terrorist event somewhere well, in Muslims the world. Can say, Muslims certainly couldn't say they were a tiny minority. They're not a tiny minority. There are 4 million Muslims in Britain. Uh, I think there are 2 billion in the world. I don't know. Uh, there are a lot. Whereas there's like 15 million Jews in the world, 275,000 in Britain. Uh, we are a tiny minority. So there's less reason for Jews demographically to be so at the centre of things than they are. Um, but yeah, no, I wrote it. I wrote it. I've been feeling since very early in the century like in about 2002 or whatever this thing which is very important for jews don't count which sometimes people don't understand which is it is not a book about anti-semitism it is a book specifically about the neglect of anti-semitism and of jewish identity jewish representation jewish inclusion all those words that are you know beloved of progressives that uh within a culture that at the same time was upping that for every other minority so it felt to me like okay, this thing that's happening now throughout culture whereby minorities in general are being given more space, more time, more witness in the world, which is kind of a good thing, but somehow or other Jews are really, really low in that mix. And I've been talking about that for a bit, and then when I was asked to write an essay book about anything, which is what happened, the Times of the Supplement asked you, I thought I'd write about that. And it is weird, quite useful for book sales but it is weird how it's not really how it's not really left this sort of relevant shelf mm. ever since then i mean useful for see this is why every the anti-semites are right that the jews have orchestrated the war in gaza in order to profit our own book sales david the sinister conspiracy yeah. never <laughs> ends i can't believe your shamelessness yeah. in just admitting on this very podcast that you were behind the october well, you know, 7th some, attack sometimes- Sometimes terrible people we operate in plain sight. Yeah, that's true. Right. So exactly. Get... So, what's the don't count? Right. Unpack the unpack the concept of not counting. Okay. So again, that's quite important that people understand that because it is misunderstood in various different ways. Like one of the ways it's misunderstood is by people who just take it literally. So, for example, uh, occasionally I get a message from someone in America where they 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 struggle a bit with irony sometimes and say, oh, I saw this book, and I, I was really worried. Like, was it just basically a Nazi text, and how could you have written it? But in Germany, in Germany, they had to change the name. In Germany, I had this brilliant thing whereby they it, they said, we can't call it Judenseelen nicht, which is Jews don't count. We can't call it that. And I, I said, why not? And they said, well, you know, with our history. And I was tempted to troll them and say, sorry, what history? <laughs> well, sorry, you'll have to go over that. Uh, and, but they just said people will take it literally, which again seemed amazing, like this sort of cliche that Germans can't get irony. But in terms of what it means, it's right. So Jews should count is basically the message. But the, what I'm really doing is I'm analyzing an attitude that I think exists mainly amongst progressives, as I say, which is that uh, within the concern that a progressive mindset would have for minorities, and by the way, this isn't just racial minorities. This would include gender minorities, sexual minorities, disabled people, whatever. Just the minorities that people care about. And often what I'm talking there is not the minorities themselves. It's kind of the white, you know, cis, het, whatever, straight, progressive person who considers themselves concerned about all these other minorities. That some or other Jews and Jewish issues and the notion of Jewish identity is not important in that. That's what I mean by not counting. Uh, and that a Jew holding up his hand or her hand and saying, I think this is anti-Semitic, you know, doesn't get the same respect uh, and deference and listen to that another minority will get in calling out racism, for example. I mean, that was very clear during the Corbyn years, is that, you know, Jews saying, hang on a minute, I think this is a bit anti-Semitic, whatever was going on, you would not get that thing, which was happening simultaneously during Black Lives Matter. Simultaneously, there was a thing whereby the progressive articles of faith became right when a person from a minority calls out discrimination against that minority primarily what you're supposed to do if you're not a member of that minority is listen not challenge what they're saying understand consider that you might have unconscious bias against them all that stuff right whether you believe in it or not that's what the progressive mindset was being adjusted towards except with jews who were told no that's not anti-semitic you're being hysterical you're a shill for Israel, whatever else it might be. So that's what I mean by not counting, is basically not being given the same space as other minorities when one talks about 
one's own identity or about racism against one's own minority. So part of the reaction that I suppose one gets to that is, yes, but other minorities are really disadvantaged and they have, they, they make less money than the, the mean and they're subjected to uh, all kinds of uh, um, uh, systemic prejudices. Whereas the Jews are doing quite well. Look at them. They, you know, they have good jobs and they make money in our society. So you can't really call them the same thing as a historically disadvantaged minority in the 21st century in the West. Right. So there's a, number of things, there's a number of things wrong with that attitude. Number one, not all forms of racism are the same. Not all, so racism is not the same and the effects of racism is not the same. So I'm not contending that the way that people are racist towards Jews is exactly the same as the way they are racist towards other minorities. In fact, it's very specific, the way that people are racist towards Jews, and that's one of the things the book's trying to isolate. Uh, the specific specificity being almost exactly what you've just said, which is a notion that Jews are not disadvantaged, not marginalised, and so therefore that they are powerful and privileged, essentially white, uh, and so that therefore they, do they can't be held to suffer. And the problem with that is, that whatever the it becomes very much about economics it's a very kind of marxist mindset but it completely ignores violence that's what it ignores and there is rising i mean obviously at the moment astonishing astonishing rising hate crime towards jews uh but even when i was writing it jews were regularly year on year out like the percentage of hate crime against jews was going up and up and up uh and with it you know this incredible growth of sort of anti-semitism online of the conviction of, of conspiracy theorists that Jews were in control of, of everything. And what it's one of the key, very important things is that people often don't see anti-Semitism as discrimination or racism because they see it as punching up. Exactly for sort of the reasons that you've just said, which is that, you know, when Kanye, for example, uh, says, I'm going to go deaf con on all Jews and issues like essentially a death threat to all Jews, however, however absurd that is, what needs to be understood is that in his own mind, he would never see that as being racist because what he sees, what he thinks, is they they are the people who control. They're in control. They control the world. They control the music industry. So what I'm doing is a rebel yell, even though Kanye is sort of much more powerful. Kanye has more followers than all the Jews in the world. Oh. He has more followers than all the Jews in the world. And yet Kanye Wait, will see himself. can that be right? Can that be right? Yeah, he's got more, what about yeah, Spielberg and to... Seinfeld and people like that? They must have followers. Oh, I'm sure Kanye's got more than them. Oh, but not I'm combined. Sure also, yes. no, it, okay. no, I don't think he's got more followers so than all mean, the Jews. May, he may be close to all the Jews combined. No, no, I'm not, sorry. Are the Kardashians Jewish in, again? I can't remember. I'm, I'm talking about the actual amount of Jews right, in the world. Right, right, so I see, I see. Million. Okay, yes, yes, yes. Kanye, yeah. I'm guessing now, but I reckon Kanye's got 80 million followers on Instagram or whatever. Right. So the point is that when Kanye says, you know, Jews control the world and I'm just shouting out against the Jews' control of this, that, and the other, then that, however absurd it might be, you know, this is someone who's got a lot of, he's got a big platform, right? Uh, and it's not seen as racism. It's just, Jews not, I mean, just in terms of the recent stuff that we've seen, you know, you saw that thing presumably in Australia where uh, people have gone on TikTok to praise Osama bin Laden's letter to America. I didn't see it specific to Australia, but I'm aware of the letter. But tell people about it if they're not. Okay, so uh, it turns out that The Guardian, a British newspaper, has on its website, I think I saw it at the time, in 2002, they published a letter by Osama bin Laden justifying the 2001 uh, Twin Tower attacks. And essentially, it seems on the surface maybe just like a uh, like an attack on America for imperialism or whatever. But I actually read it, and if you read it, it's not really an attack on America, it's an attack on Jews. I mean, it's wholeheartedly an attack on Jews. America is just seen as the pawn of Jews, and the real evil control of the world is Jews, and uh, the West is totally in the sway of Jews and whatever. So then what happened was, I don't know if anyone saw this, but anyway, it was a big deal. Uh, a lot of Gen Z people were going on TikTok having read the letter in the Guardian, and basically saying, hey, it's amazing. I've had my whole ideas turned upside down because, like, I thought he was a bad guy. But it turns out he was just a kind of freedom fighter. And, you know, he was a liberation guy and blah, blah, blah. And kind of, you know, with this element of, I've seen this in Palestine, so it must be true uh, about this guy as well because he's from the Middle East and whatever. And I didn't watch all of them because that would have rotted my brain. But I got a real sense that the th they didn't even notice lots of them. 
that the letter was primarily uh, like something from Ni- Mein Kampf. I mean, really, it's like something from Mein Kampf. It is infested with the idea that Jews are in control of money and capital and banking and politics and and their and that their influence is totally malign and that therefore they need to be destroyed. And it's like these young people are just saying, "Hey, he was punching back." That I'd never understood this before. But what Osama was doing with the Twin Towers was punching back and blah blah blah. And that feels to me like more and more and more it's hard to counter that people are so obsessed with this binary of victimizers and victimized of oppressed and oppressors and jews are somehow never allowed to be the victimized despite the years and years and years of persecution and genocide and you know the cyclical loop by the way you you said in the 21st century i mean the cyclical loop of history would suggest that the persecution and violence against jews is definitely not over i mean in the 21st century you know there's been the largest religious massacre in america was in pittsburgh of jews in 2018 in argentina 86 jews were killed uh in i don't know i can't remember 2016 i think i mean jews are still being killed in large amounts you know all over the world what's also interesting that i mean a lot of people don't realize is that as just as victims of hate crimes i don't know what it is in the uk but i checked recently again to make sure i wasn't wrong about this but in and in australia and the us by far the largest group uh, of, of hate crime victims is jews you know, we we yeah. we see a lot less of it for some reason in the in the press and it looms larger that you know some crazy right winger punches a person wearing a sikh turban or you know that muslims uh, are being denigrated, but I think it was about three or four times the number of uh, Jews are victims of hate crimes in Australia and the US than any other minority, including sexual m- minorities. So that's just a, a background reality that doesn't get a yeah. huge amount of publicity. Well, one of, one of the reasons for that, Josh, is that, uh, of course, we get, we, and I'm including you in this because you're Jewish, aren't you? uh, is, is we get hate from both ends of the political spectrum. Uh, and, you know, we get this far-right people, the the killer in Pittsburgh. He was a far-right gunman who believed that um, uh, this thing called the Great Replacement Theory, which, in fact, Elon Musk has just condoned on Twitter. So, I don't know if you know that. Do you no. know that? But okay, Tucker's so been banging theory. on about it for, for you know, 10 years. Oh, yeah, so, I didn't realise that Elon was on, on that bandwagon. But, yeah, oh, yeah explain yeah, it to people a... who aren't familiar with it. Okay. So the Great Replacement Theory, which once again pictures Jews as ultimately in control, you must always, re- re- you know, all of these ideas, they always imagine Jews as having a malign but extremely powerful influence. Uh, so right-wing people believe that uh, multiculturalism and immigration uh, have been designed by Jews to undermine the Aryan white races, literally to sort of dilute the DNA pool of the Aryan white races, and that what we're doing is like secretly bussing in brown and black people to white countries in order to undermine the white people so that we can take over the world. And lots of people believe versions of this. Um, and uh, recently, I believe that and it was the reason. So it was the, the the gunman who killed 11 Jews in Pittsburgh was on Gab, which is what like where extremists used to have to go before Twitter became what it is now under Elon. And, and he he believed that because of the Tree of Life synagogue, in Pittsburgh was helping. Can you believe this? He was help. He was helping Syrian refugees to settle in America as a charitable thing. He believed that was evidence of the Great Replacement, and he actually said, "I'm going in, having been talking about this for like I don't know a hundred gabs, and then and then killed them." Right, but but then the other day, um, some cunt. Can I say that? Well, I'll, we might even bleep that one, but go for it. Cunt okay. away. Some terrible person uh, on social media said, oh, Jews hate white people. This is very interesting in terms of this notion of Jews are white. I've said this before, that Jews are Schrodinger's whites in that they're seen as sort of non-white by right-wing people or or very white by left-wing people. But some, some right-wing bloke was saying Jews hate white people uh, and they hate white people, which is why they're promoting, you know, immigration. It was, it was just the usual yeah. stuff, really. And, and Elon said that's the truth. All right, because he Elon, I think because he's South African, has quite a lot of big thing in it, big chip on his shoulder about what he considers to be anti-white racism. Right. Now, whatever, whatever you think about the idea or not of anti-white racism, it's not an idea I'm very interested in. Really, is part of the Great Replacement theory is Jews hate white people. 
Right. Uh, and so, uh, apparently we're, yes, trying to undermine them so that we can take over them. Uh, and it positions Jews as non-white or whatever. Anyway, the, I'm saying all this because to answer your point about hate crime is that Jews get hate from right-wing people and left-wing people and Islamists. And that's partly why we're so... Top, top of the league of hate on, on the grade replacement theory people might remember that when the uh the 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 losers with tiki torches went marching through charlottesville during mm. the trump uh, yeah. administration they were chanting jews will not replace us which seemed yes. weird at the time it seemed like why don't they just yeah. say kill the jews or why don't they just say you know yeah. like what what do you mean replace uh, who there aren't enough jews to replace you until it was explained to me yeah. that the theory is that the jews are trying to yeah. replace good upstanding members of western civilization with dirty hordes from abroad as part yeah. of the jewish conspiracy that's, or undermine western civilization and that's correct uh, yeah. i didn't know that all yeah yeah uh, that's absolutely right. i think that's in my book i i thought why are they saying that and i think i make a joke about we can't replace you because we would never wear that shirt yeah. <laughs> uh, that's right. it all looks terrible uh, yeah and, but it's not it's not about us replacing them like for like as yeah it were. yeah uh us uh orchestrating their yeah and and but so i think whenever we talk like this about about part of the nefariousness of uh the slight against jews being the claim that we control everything it's important also to concede jews have been wildly successful so people can point to examples of disproportionate jewish control over finance and media is that being made up? Is there a, I mean, I feel some need for us to have some kind of cultural explanation for the success of Jews. Do you? Well, no, I don't. I mean, well, disproportionate thing. I, I, I push back against it generally, not least because it's often not true. Like, for example, you know, it, uh, I looked into this. Uh, it's sort of the obvious example, but during the 1920s in Germany, it was a belief held not just by, you know, emergent Nazis, but by the population at large, that Jews controlled the banking system in Germany. That was just a given thing. Everyone thought it was true. Uh, and the actual truth was there were 2% of Jews. 2% of the bank of the banking system were Jewish, uh, which was about in line, maybe slightly over, because uh, there weren't that many uh, Jews, you know, who were of the right age to work in that sector. Uh, I think... Uh, also, by the way, this disproportionality does not work again with other minorities, really, except possibly gays and musicals and stuff. But <laughs> I mean, I, 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 you know, there are a lot of black people who are very dominant in football now in Britain. Now, I don't think that's a thing that you would say that that's a problem or that that's disproportionate, or whatever. There's just a lot of very talented black footballers, right? Uh, and Jews are, yeah, Jews are good at certain things, just like other minorities might be good at certain things, and they're quite good at storytelling. So there's quite a lot of them have gone into theatre and film and whatever. Even the, this notion that they control Hollywood is kind of a weird one. Jews built some of Hollywood because they arrived in Hollywood as immigrants, uh, unable to go into lots and lots of businesses because they just weren't allowed to, and they were good at sort of vaudeville and things like that, and from that, the Hollywood appeared. But even then, you know... Like, one of the things I think is most interesting, there's a bit, as you know, in the book about sort of authenticity casting, right? Uh, and about how every minority, in ways that are not, I think, that helpful for acting, but anyway, it just is the case, every minority now has to be played in line with the minority of the character. You know, whether that be or the obvious ones, which is black or brown people, but also deaf people, autistic people, whatever. Uh, but Jews can always be played by non-Jews or whatever. And then I occasionally meet people and they say to me, well, Jews are overrepresented anyway. They say Jews are overrepresented in film or TV. So they, and I want to say to them, well, they're not, clearly, because if they could cast Jewish actors, I think they would. What they do is they think can't find a Jewish actor who's a big enough star to play Leonard Bernstein or Golda Meir. We have, there just isn't one. There's not that many. So therefore, we're going to have to cast a non-Jew and we're not that worried about that because we know we won't get the same trouble yeah. as if we cast a non-trans you know, person a as a trans person or a yeah, non-gay non person, person as a gay person, yeah. let alone a white yeah. person as a yeah as a person yeah. of color. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you think so? I I don't know if I, I I really buy it. I think okay. So it's a complicated thing, and I I was once asked to do this thing, uh, this program about sort of Jewish success. You know about like like should we not grasp Jewish success? Should we not own Jewish success because Jews are 
yeah, they are very small minority. And it is true that, and I am sort of proud of it, but I, I say sort of, I'll explain why I said sort of, that 22% of Nobel Prize winners are Jews, despite 0.05% of the world's population being Jews. And I think, yeah, okay, perhaps we just should just own that. We should be proud of it, which we should. The trouble is, because there are so many fucking anti-Semites in the world, is we can't be purely proud of it, because some will say, well, that's because Jews control science, right? Right. Or that's because Jews control the institutions. Yeah. I think the and they don't. I think the explanation. Really I mean, the the most plausible explanations that I've heard, which are likeliest to placate the conspiracy, the anti-Jewish conspiracy theorists, are that Jews have a, a cultural tradition of valuing education and a, a kind of Talmudic learning in the family and debate and argumentation. So there are cultural reasons why Jews would excel in uh, in cultural spheres, including entertainment and the media. Uh, and academia. And then there is a history of exclusion from the legitimate professional classes that has led to Jews becoming traitors in a lot of places uh, because it was the only way they could get by. And that explains some history of Jews being dominant in finance because they couldn't become, uh, you know, they couldn't, they couldn't have a job that required you to get some kind of slip of paper from a government that gave you credibility uh, to have. And so I think once you sort of concede the punching above one's weight in those spheres, then you can acknowledge that there's, uh, um, for want of a better word, over-representation of Jews in successful spheres in those. Uh, and yeah, then, I'm prepared to accept Yeah, But I, I also think there's something else, which is that, you know, other minorities do, like uh, East Asians are, you know, do very well and whatever and don't tend to suffer from sort of structural uh, disadvantages or whatever. But it's only really Jews that get this kind of malign thing like like you know classifying jews in a way that would not be allowable for other minorities is allowable so there's a famous play called the layman trilogy which you may be aware of i don't know it's it's played for it on the west end of broadway and that's not written by a jew but it absolutely portrays banking as sort of modern banking sort of being invented by these three jews i mean they're real people the layman brothers so they were jewish right but they portray that their Jewishness as absolutely integral to why they became successful bankers. And then that follows to them sort of nearly destroying the world at right. the time of the global crash. Right? So Jews, their banking, Jew equals banker equals, you know, do they have the world coming. hooked noses and are they sniveling and do they scurry around on rooftops well, well, and go well, yidle well, deedle well, deedle money money? Well, they do originally in the play. And of course, they're not played by Jews. That's the other thing. Is that, <laughs> it's that on Broadway, and and they're all not played by Jews. They're played by other minority actors, yeah, actually, right, mainly. Right. Um, and the, my point is, whether, even if it's true, right, even if it's maybe there's some truth, the Lehman Brothers were Jewish, right, then I think you have to ask the question, but someone still decided to write a play about that and put it on stage, and critics loved it, and no one questioned Brr. whether that was okay. Whereas I promise you, a negative portrayal of any other minority, even if it were true, historically true would not there would be questions asked about it people say well, why why is this playwright or why has the national theater decided to focus on this negative idea of gays or black people or whatever whatever it might be mm, no one asked mm. that question very very recently very recently that question has been asked of that play that's right i mean you also make the point in the book that there are all kinds of other minorities that do well along other metrics i mean you mentioned uh, you know black brits and football but i mean you know Hindus in America earn more than the average American as well, and we don't use that as a reason to claim that anti, uh, you know, Indian or anti-Hindu uh, sentiment is valid in some way. Or, you know, we don't we don't yeah. say we don't say that racism against South Asians isn't quite as bad as racism against other groups because they're doing all right financially yeah. in the United States. That doesn't wash. Yeah, and also the the. I think there's one point. There's only one point where I get slightly. I try and stop being angry in the book. There's an anger in the book, but I think it's controlled. But there's one point where I slightly lose it, uh, and that is I'm sort of talking about this. I'm talking about this constant association of Jews with money, and the sort of sense of that somehow does excuse all sorts of, uh, you know, violence and negative imagery around Jews or whatever. And then I just say fuck off about money in the book because my point is. It's a very neo-Marxist idea that all that matters is economic circumstance because I can promise you that, as I say in the book, 
uh, that many, many Jews, including my grandparents, may have been rich at one point. And then what happens is a violent sense that they should not have that money, even though they will have earned it in a completely fair and okay way under a capitalist society. They shouldn't have it. That somewhere or other, them having that money is illicit and, you know, involves some kind of control that they shouldn't have. And then a rising up happens, a reprisal happens, a correction happens, which in the case of my grandparents led to their whole family being murdered. Sure. You know, and, and that's the thing, is that these con this constant sense of, like, all that matters is economic circumstance. The Jews are doing okay, so therefore we shouldn't worry about the Jews. I think that's a hop, skip, and jump from that to, oh, and actually they're doing too okay, and they shouldn't have that big house, and they shouldn't have that sure. car or whatever it might be, and let's take it away from them. Let's, and that, that is what's happened cyclically throughout history. Why do you think it is that, so let's just park the behaviour of the right and look at the behaviour of the left, that over the past 10 or 20 years as the left has become, has moved away from concerns about, I guess, um, economic inequality and class and towards, uh, a, you know, worldview of diversity and equity that's based on the identity groups of people and the importance of lifting up historically marginalised racial and gender and sexual communities. Why Jews aren't in that i mean when they are in that the point that you make in your book is that when they are in that it's always is usually couched on the left in terms of like we denounce anti-semitism and all other forms of bigotry including blah 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 you rarely get just like yeah <laughs> jews <laughs> jews shouldn't be shat on but they are being shat on yeah yeah no you well you don't and i think i in the book i suggest that the tendency of the left never to just talk about anti-semitism in a supportive way. Obviously, they sometimes talk about it in a defensive way. They're, they're often saying, how dare you suggest that the left is anti-Semitic? But if they talk about it in a supportive way, like we abhor anti-Semitism, it's always with and all other types of racism. It often is with and Islamophobia, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And I suggest that that's the left's all lives matter. Uh, that, you know, the suggestion, which was correct, I think, that people who didn't like Black Lives Matter tend to say, well, all lives matter, that that is a diminishment of the specific issues that black people face uh, in America, but elsewhere in, in the world. Uh, and people acknowledge that. And normally someone who wanted to say all lives matter was, you know, dogpiled on by the left because of a sense that they were ignoring that specific issue. But with um, anti-Semitism, without fail, it's always broadened out into a spectrum of all things. Uh, all minorities are, of course, equally important. In terms of why, well, I mean, the, the the movement away from just pure old, you know, concerns of the left to do with class and to do with economics or whatever, is just a lot to do, I think. I don't know that much. I don't know really what the answer is. I'd say in the book that it's happened. In terms of why it's happened, I think it's just the nature of late capitalism and also the internet. So what the internet is, in my opinion, is not a marketplace of ideas, but a marketplace of identity. So I think what we've done is we've given a camera essentially, to everybody and to project their own life onto the world. And what that means is that people are able to say, this is me. And how do you say this is me in a, in a high volume way? You do it by saying, I belong to this tribe, uh, whatever it might be. Sometimes that involves the creation of new tribes to be really exciting and new and different. And, you, you, and it helps if you can say, I hate all other tribes, because that makes you more you know, I, your identity more focused and clear and whatever. That's why social media is so antagonistic and angry and all the rest of it. And because the left is about power, it's about the association of who's the powerful and who's the powerless, I must be on the side of the powerless. The more you get these identities emerging, the more the left seeks out the ones it can claim are the powerless, often the new powerless, because uh, they're not interested in the old powerless. Uh, and Jews are always a problem within that. They're always a problem because of this notion that Jews are powerful and because of the notion that Jews are white, which I've said earlier. They are, you know, at the heart of it is 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 wealth. It's this notion of wealth and whiteness is very important. And uh, as I try and say in the book, as I said already, that Jews are, are both white and non-white, which mm. is the truth. Um, and that's nothing to do with skin colour, although I have in my time been beaten up. When I was a kid, I was beaten up by people who thought I was a Pakistani. But that's not the point. The fact that some Jews are not are actually non-white is irrelevant. The point is that Jews are classified as non-white by the far right and classified as ultra-white by the left. Uh, and 
the classification of Jews as white is one of the many things that disqualifies them from being, you know, as concerned as, as they are about other minorities. Mm. It's interesting, isn't it? Because, I mean, gays are all, you know, white gays yes. are all white. Well, they're not. <laughs> no, they're not all white. <laughs> gays as a group well, look, are not I, all I, white. I, 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 just, <laughs> Josh, I, I think I said to you when we were having dinner, <laughs> I think I said to you and, you, and I'd like you to talk a bit about this about without getting you into more trouble, hey. uh, that I think that the, the, the minority that might be closest in terms of the not counting phenomenon with progressives is gay men. Uh, that I think gay white men, uh, there's the same sense, I think, which is part of it, which is like, yeah, they've had their moment. Right. They're, cut, they're economically fine, generally. They've had their moment. We fought for them. Now they're fine. We must move on. And and that just ignores the possibility of homophobia and all the rest of it. I mean... I mean yeah, that may be true, but I also think that gay white men have so successfully captured the elite uh, university educated conversation around um, what uh, identity and diversity means that that, that it's not right. analogous to. Like, we really have one. Like, there isn't an organization in the West that doesn't have uh, an aggressively pro LGBTQIA plus. Uh, you know, agenda and where it, one of the worst things that you could possibly do as an employee would be to make a homophobic slur against a work colleague. I mean, you get hauled up against HR yeah. instantly. Whereas you could probably say something yeah. about the fucking Zionists. You might no, sort you of mean you could no, no, kind right. of mean yeah. Jews. You know, so like the the yeah. conversation I think is still the elite conversation is still a lot more comfortable with latent anti-Semitism than it is with latent homophobia. Yeah, no, I agree with that. I, I, I mean specifically, sort of gay white men. I think, I think, I think that obviously within the LGBTQ umbrella, yeah, there's many. You've many, forgot a couple, uh, I think, but I'll let it pass. Yes, yeah. got a couple. Yeah. Of them. Well, there's many, is... many. Tri- well, well, there's many tribes within within that umbrella that uh, progressives see it, see almost at the top of the tree of people they need to fight for, mm. uh, and. Uh, and I and obviously it's quite a wide umbrella, whatever. But I mean, I think I don't want to get into it because I can already hear the horde shouting at me about it. But I I I think that the the notion of you know economic comfort uh, and yeah and whiteness and all the rest of it, mm. it it doesn't allow apart from anything for the complications of being Jewish. Like my niece is half Jewish, half black. Right, she's a Jewish person of color. In Israel, uh, 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 you know, there's a very strong sense, I think, at, uh, at the moment that Israel represents a kind of outpost of whiteness uh, in the Middle East and that what people feel they're supporting uh, are uh, oppressed uh, Arabs against Jews. But there's an enormous amount of Arab Israelis, there's an enormous amount of Mizrahi Israelis, of Iraqi Israelis, so about 50% of Israelis are what you might consider to be brown people, mm. right? And in a way, what I'm arguing for always in, in the book is just like the truth being complex. Because I'm arguing against the binaries of good and evil. I'm ask, arguing against the idea that we always know who the good is and the baddies are. And Jews are Jews are so often a glitch in that. You know, it's like if, you, if you're someone who believes I just want to fight for the people who have got nothing or whatever and, and against the people who have got everything, a minute later... You're going to be you're going to be like burning down Jews' houses. I think <laughs> that's the problem. It is interesting that we're in the sort of oppression Olympics. You know, the hierarchy of uh, victimized identities. If you take the you know, let's say the gay person, and then you add on another disadvantaged uh, minority status, like they're a person of color, and then you add on another minority status, like they're a trans person, then they sort of rise higher and higher on the priority lists of a good progressive, right? You know, such that a, a trans yeah. uh, woman of colour who is also an Arab Muslim is now even more worthy of our support uh, and protection than uh, than if you removed one of those attributes. But if you add Jew, it doesn't yeah. quite work the same, it's does mi- it? Mi- it's always a minus. I mean, I, I, as you said it then, I thought, well, that's a minus. I mean, it's. I know it's the case. I know it's the case that um, you know, young Jews who might want to be in these spaces, like you know, fighting the good fight against whoever, you know, they tend to not put forward their Jewishness. Uh, you know, some of the most heartbreaking letters I've got, although also sometimes at least a little bit inspiring because the books help them, have come from young people, young Jews who are uh, 
you know, in rooms with people who either are of other minorities or at least people who want to fight for minorities. Uh, and they end up not telling them they're Jewish because they know that that won't be taken seriously or won't be a thing uh, and indeed might just lead to some kind of, you know, anti-Semitism in the room. Uh, like, I remember one guy writing to me and saying, I want to say, I'm in these rooms. He was like 18. And he's very much like a kid who wants to be going on marches and whatever. And he says, I want to say I'm Jewish because I want to be able to them to know who I am and I want them to know my own stuff, whatever. But I know they won't consider it legitimate. I remember him saying, use the word legitimate. And that's true, right? In terms of what you've just said, you know, listing those things that will be taken seriously, it's true that you, you can just hear it, can't you? You can mm. just hear that that sounds like a bum note. It's like adding straight in, white in, male to, to it. Yeah, straight white male. Yeah. To, yeah you're not helping. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 No, it's not. yeah. And, and what, what is amazing about that is, you know, uh, Jews are you know, arguably the most persecuted minority of all time. It sort of feels... I feel. I, by the way, having said that, I want to make it clear, I don't like the fucking persecutory Olympics. I, I hate it, and some people accuse me of joining in with it, but really what I'm doing is saying, no, I, I'm, I'm saying we are not at the table of this. We're not in the conversation about it, and we should be in the conversation about it. We should, you know, Jews should be in the conversation, but I'm not trying to push anyone out or say that Jews is more important or less important. I'm just saying we should be part of the conversation about discrimination because... Look at the fucking history. Jews have been, you know, pogromed and massacred and and all over the world, by the way. I didn't even, I read a book, this brilliant book called People Love Dead Jews by Dara Hall, which is essentially about how people will revere Jews as long as they're being killed, right? But they don't really like it. <laughs> they don't really like it when they're being sort of uppity and annoying and alive and all the things or whatever. And one of the things about the book, is like <laughs> people think I'm Mr. Jew here, right? They think I know it. I don't. Like she's like telling me in the book about massacres in China, massacres in South America, massacres. I mean, Jews have been like really. It's amazing that there are even 15 million left. Very um, and you know, I kind of think like so. How can it end up that when you're in a room, when a young Jew is in a room of people talking about how they have to fight for minorities, he is too embarrassed to mention that he's Jewish. How can that be? Well, let's talk about the elephant in the room then, which is the Jewish state uh, and whether or not Israel's existence and behavior has contributed to this perception that Jews are powerful and wielding that power in unethical ways over other poor, disadvantaged people. What's your relationship to Israel? Well, my basic position on Israel, which has come under pressure since October the 7th, uh, and I haven't quite sorted it all out in my head yet, so we'll have to talk about that. But my basic position on Israel for a very long time was that um, the primary way in which a progressive person, almost any, but certainly a progressive person, but almost anyone, will react to someone talking about anti-Semitism like me, publicly or whatever, the first thing they'll say is, well, what about Israel? What about Palestine? Blah, blah, blah. Even when what I'm talking about is anti-Semitism in Britain or whatever. Uh, and my position has always been that itself is kind of racist. You wouldn't ask that. Uh, you wouldn't go up to a British uh, Muslim talking about Islamophobia in the Tory party in Britain and say, please explain how you feel about human rights in Saudi Arabia or, you know, the killing of the Rohingya in Myanmar. Before you, before you can say anything about this subject, you need to clear the air that wouldn't happen that would be considered to be racist and it happens all the time to jews it's a reflex thing about jews it's happening incredibly at the moment so i tweeted something about my cats uh today i often tweet about my cats and i don't look at responses on twitter now but i thought i can check this one because it's just i'll get some nice pictures of cats and about five down it was stop fucking talking about your cats you wanker why don't you talk about what's happening your beloved zionist terrorist state and what it's doing in gaza blah 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 uh, so there's a reflex thing and I would refuse it and I continue to refuse it I continue to say uh, it is not my responsibility as a British Jew to and and also I don't I don't I don't I know a lot of Jews do I don't have a great feeling of sort of soulful or romantic association with the state of Israel having said that I felt incredibly moved and disturbed and upset by what happened on October the 7th in a way that sort of overrode 
my normal kind of disengagement with the state of Israel. And I think that's to do with like how much it rung a bell in the sort of intergenerational trauma of me as someone whose mum was born in Nazi Germany and whose relatives have all been murdered. Uh, because I think it felt like, oh, it's that kind of violence. It's a pogrom. And that kind of violence is impossible to pretend that you don't feel connected to in a bad way. Uh, so I still feel that. And I also feel like at the moment, anti-Semitism is going th so through the roof that I have to talk about the situation, even though I'm, I'm still going to say, stop asking me to answer for a foreign country, for the actions of a foreign country, because I don't have to do that. The demand, the demand that as a British Jew, I still have to answer for the actions of the Israeli government is itself racist. I think it's fair enough to question why people don't want to talk about anti-Semitism in the West without spinning the conversation back to Israel. And at the same time, I feel as a Jewish guy, as, as, a, as a gay guy, let's take a different analogy. As a gay guy, I feel some standing to criticize my fellow gays in the way that they prosecute pride and not just standing but maybe duty uh, to tease out where I think the movement has gone awry. Um, you mentioned yeah, but Muslims. Can I ask you a question? Yes. I mean, we started off talking about that. I don't know if we. I don't know, by the way, if we're including that conversation at the no. start because I was a bit worried about it. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> uh, so because I, well, I think that um, you know, I would say that you wanting to do that is up to you, right? But I don't think it's up to non-gay people to uh, demand of you that you have an opinion either way right. about pride, right? Right. I mean, pride obviously is is hardly similar in terms of people all having a febrile opinion about it, right? But if it was the case that everyone had a febrile opinion about whether or not pride should happen, I think that's the conversation for you to have. And as a gay person, you have an opinion about it. But I don't think you should be in a position whereby someone is saying, unless you talk about this, I'm not going to take any of your opinions seriously. About no, I think that's homophobia. I think that's fine. But like I, I also think that they would that I would understand why there was a uh, greater suspicion towards the gay community if we were all being sort of evasive and hegemonic about the problems with in the community than if we were wrestling openly with it. I, I mean, take the analogy of Muslims that you just gave. Like, we don't ask Muslims to answer for Saudi Arabia. And yet, after 9-11, I don't think it was entirely illegitimate for us to feel that... I mean, if I was a Muslim and I had the Taliban speaking on behalf of all Muslims and bin Laden claiming to be working on behalf of all Muslims, I would sort of want to distance myself from that claim. And, you know, Israel is not just like Saudi Arabia is towards towards Muslims. Yeah, but also it's Israel not like, claims also to be like, speaking on behalf of all Jews. Yeah, it does. No, I agree with that, although I don't think the 9-11 analogy quite works because they attacked America, right? They attacked America. So Americans you know, may or may not, I mean, I don't know, but it might still be considered to be racist, but it's sort of understandable maybe that Americans who might have lost people in the Twin Towers might, you know, be a bit cross with some American Muslims. And it's still not maybe fair. It might still be rate or whatever, but you know what I mean? Israel is not bombing other countries. It's bombing a country within the Middle East and whether or not that, that I don't, I still, I, still, I just do not understand why that gives a British person who feels they're very righteous and progressive, the right to attack a British Jew for saying whatever. No, I don't, know, think, that's, saying... I don't think that's the claim, though. I mean, isn't, isn't, isn't the question whether or not all Jews in the world are being dragged down by the misbegotten policies no. of, a, of, a, of a group of people in the Middle East who claim to speak on behalf of all of them? It's like if there was, if there was some weird cult in Detroit that said it's working on behalf of all people named David globally and it's stealing Toyota Camrys. You know, it's it's carjacking Toyota yep. Camrys on behalf of David's. Wouldn't you be like, right. well, hang on, actually, just to be clear, not this David, yeah. not this one. Yeah. Well, actually, I don't completely agree. I, 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 I think that whole not in my name thing is, like, it leads to a sort of craven thing, in my opinion, whereby I, I think that it, I think the expectation should not be on the innocent person to say this is nothing to do with me. Uh, I think it should be, 
you know, like like it is for most minorities, like it would feel like an odd demand to insist that most minorities, uh, and this is ethnic more than anything else, have to sort of clear the air about how they feel about the behaviour of a foreign state before they're allowed to talk about their own identity in a different country. It seems to me like that's the responsibility not of them, but of the people making the demand. Uh, but having said that, I I just don't feel that connection. You know, it's weird because, like, I don't know, do, do Israel say they speak for all Jews? I mean, I don't know if they do say that. Well, it's the homeland for the Jews. No, it's yeah, well, it the isn't. Jewish actually, state. Actually, I went to a place today where two Jews did describe it as their homeland, and I instantly thought, how? Yeah. How is it? No, I mean, I, I agree mean, I that it's not, but it definitely says that it is. So whether it claims to be speaking on behalf of all Jews, it certainly it certainly looks it, it, smells like it's doing so because it claims to be the Jews' homeland. Yeah. Well, I don't feel the need to constantly disengage. It's sort of like I don't feel the need to anymore, I used to more, to look on Twitter to find out what everyone's saying about me, right? Because I kind of think like, People are going to be saying shit and doing shit or whatever, and some of it might feel like it's associated with me, but it's not my responsibility to disclaim myself from that, is what I think. I mean, I know a lot of people do feel differently. In my documentary that I did on my book, I don't know if you saw that. No, it, 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 not yet. Okay, it's gone out in Australia, but I can send it to you. There's right. a, I have a long argument with Miriam Margulis, who is massively left-wing and massively anti-Zionist, and her position is... Is, is in a way much more connected to Israel than mine. You know, she's massively anti-Zionist, but she feels much more connected to Israel. And because she feels connected to Israel, she does feel like it is my duty, it is our duty to call out these people who are doing stuff in your name. And I kind of think like it's not, I don't have to say it's not in my name. Uh, to even have to say publicly it's not in my name feels to me like, why am I having to do this? It's not, you know, it just happens to be the one country that has that on its flag, right? So there's a focus on it. But there's, you know, I mean, Stephen Fry, uh, in the same documentary, says how many Christians feel the need to disassociate themselves from Vladimir Putin. Right, he's Christian, and often, and has said that the crusade in the Ukraine is a God-given crusade. Right, he said that. He said that he believes he's doing the work of the Christian God by de defeating Ukraine. I've never seen a single Christian say I have to disengage myself from the work of Vladimir Putin. Uh, as a Christian. I mean, he's not the so sole Christian state. I mean, you know, Vatican yeah, City exists. Yeah, but that's the problem, is it? The focus is because it's the only one. And it's the only one because it's a tiny minority and all the rest of it, right? It's not our fault that it's the only one. It happens to be the only one because lots of Jews have been killed, right? Uh, so Miriam but, Margulies needs to set up a Jewish state in Tasmania, which, she, yeah, which so exhibits if there were all like of seven the... Jewish yeah. states, yeah, yeah, there'd be less of a problem. That's, that's true. I don't know if I don't even if that bit will be that popular at the moment. <laughs> me saying there should be seven Jewish states. Oh dear. But I, you know, I don't know. It feels really weird at the moment because, like, I do think that there are things about what's happening at the moment in Israel that I still feel the need to comment on, even though I don't like to feel like oh, I have to talk about Israel. Like, one of them is, which is happening a lot, is that a lot of progressives and other people are sort of denying what happened on October the 7th, right? Um, like the brutality of it and the fact that people were raped and people were extreme types of torture went on. And that feels to be like Holocaust denial, right? Because I know that stuff happened. I'm aware of the footage of it. I've been invited to see footage of it. I've seen some of it. It's really hard to watch all of it. Uh, and, you know, in the same way that it's hard to watch the liberation of Belson, right? And people deny that too, and why are people denying it, right? People are denying it because it confuses their idea of good and bad. In the same way, why are people tearing down hostage posters? Because hostage po you know that happens, right? Yep. I mean, it happens in yeah, Australia. Yeah, it does, yeah. People yeah, so and, these, and are the host down... these are the Jewish, the Israeli hostages who are being held by Hamas. Right. And there are some posters yeah. up saying, you know, I, we lost so-and-so. They're still in, in Gaza somewhere. And... Yeah, and, and, and I think the reason, the them. reason they tear down hostage posters is because, it comes back to one thing I said earlier, which is that one thing that does happen is that Israel-Palestine gets framed in a very, very uh, binary way. And one of the binary ways it gets framed is that, like, anything that happens bad to Israelis must just be liberation fighting and 
whatever, and not not a bad thing. And anything that the Israelis do, do is entirely bad. And the problem with that is I don't care about Israel Palestine. What I care about is the truth. And the truth is more complicated than mm. that. And the truth is that on October the 7th, really terrible stuff was visited on innocent people. And so in that moment, those Jews, those Israeli Jews, were not the oppressors in those moments. They were the vulnerable in those moments. And that is now being erased by people who just can't bear the idea in the same way that the hostages' posters are being t- torn down because they represent an idea of vulnerable Jews. Well, I think the people doing the tearing down would say uh, that mm-hmm. it's a it's a distraction from the core issue, which is that millions of people have been forced to live in squalor in you know outdoor refugee camps in perpetuity with no hope of a better life. So yes, that is the, 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 hosti- the hostage is bad, but there are, there's a, there are millions of people who have effectively been hostages for years, and we never saw posters about them. Yeah, but that's not that isn't a reason to tear them down. I mean, it's, I don't agree. I mean, you know, I, I I that is like if you want to make that point, make that point. You don't have to tear the hot tear them down unless you, what you feel is I can't bear complexity. Well, sometimes sometimes mobs aren't subtle, uh, David. I find no, no, that's in my the point. Experience. It is mob thinking. Yeah, it's mob thinking, and and it. it I mean, if you, I mean, I, you know, I think the whole thing becomes a stupid battle in the West. Of an idea of of like which who's right and who's wrong and all the rest of it and after a while nuance gets completely lost. Well, wouldn't it, I mean I guess so, we can talk sort of we can talk about the morality of expecting Jews or any community to answer for people who do mis who do misdeeds in their name and we can talk about the strategy of own of trying to own one's own distance from people who are doing things in your name from inside the community but just tactically wouldn't there be less anti-semitism if there wasn't this easy narrative for people to look at and this ongoing trauma being visited on a people um well yeah uh to some extent uh the notion that that or all anti-Semitism springs from that is is itself anti-Semitic uh, because it diminishes a centuries-old uh, racism to something that's just existed for the last sort of 70 years. So Tariq Ali, for example, who is a uh, activist in 2019 where there was also an incursion into Gaza by Israel, there was a march in London and Tariq Ali stood up and said, um, that if the occupation stopped, anti-Semitism would end. And I don't know if he knows, but before the State of Israel was formed, there was quite a big global anti-Semitic incident. Um, so, and and it, it's incredibly, at some level, sort of like disrespectful to, to Jews, the notion that, you know, oh yeah, there's this one thing that, that has led to all this anti-Semitism and everything else would be fine. It's not just it disrespectful to Jews; it's disrespectful to anti-Semites. I mean, let's give them the credibility of their yeah. own convictions. You yeah. know, they've been they've been on this well, bandwagon for for millennia. They're not they, Johnny Come Lately's to this particular fact. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, you're absolutely right. It's really unfair to the Inquisition. Yeah, exactly. Example. That's right. They've been onto like, this. They've I'm been on you. on this bandwagon for a long time. Um, I mean, I mean. I mean, every day, I have to say, every day there is a new thing. Like, (laughs) I was just reading a review of a book about uh, the Bolsheviks. uh, It was in the Sunday Times. Uh, And uh, the British, apparently, were helping whatever part of the Russians during the Russian Civil War after the Bolsheviks were power. they They were trying to suppress the Bolsheviks, right? And it became that they decided, well, the Bolsheviks are kind of similar to the Jews. Quite a lot of Jews are Bolsheviks. And they just killed thousands and thousands and thousands of Jews, right? And Churchill and other people were totally behind it, right? In fact, in fact, there's a quote in the book saying, well, the Jews were kind of responsible for the Russian Revolution. So, you know, so they can expect this and whatever. And so my point is that, really, I promise you, if you go and look at the history, the idea that anti-Semitism is just about Israel is not true. I don't disagree that, a lot of modern anti-Semitism is wrapped up in Israel. Um, it certainly still burgeons out if you actually read, like, not that you should, but some of the really vile anti-Semitism online, it might start with talking about Zionists, and the next thing you know, it'll be about how they control 
you know, all the banks in America and whatever else it might be. Um, someone said to me the other day, and maybe this is true, that anti-Semitism in the Muslim community is very, very centered around Israel. And if that problem was somehow sorted out, that there would be less of that. I wonder if that is true. That might be truer than the idea that the sort of global essentially mainly white christian anti-semitism would would not go away but maybe it would I'd go find, away I'd more i can just on my pew basing based on nothing but my own ignorance that smells actually counterintuitive to me i mean i think that yeah. muslim anti-semitism has an extremely long history and jews being pigs and sons of goats and things goes back to long before israel's to me if anything it would be the reverse that that in mm-hmm. that you wouldn't see the same level of kind of Jew hate among white progressives on university campuses in the West if it weren't for Israel, because there it's not innate. Well, well I mean, certainly, it's not, that, it's certainly that is the to the t- culture. I mean, without doubt, that's obviously the touch paper for it. I, I mean, I don't wish to be depressive, but as I say, the the loop of history would suggest that people will find ways to be anti-Semitic. Whatever why? the geo situation. Well, because they have done. Empirically, it's the truth. But why? Throughout that, why? History. Where? Where from? Like, what's the mechanism by which that's emerging? Uh, well, it emerges from a conjunction of the far right, the continual far right myth that Jews are in control of money and the media and all the rest of it, and a sort of far left acquiescence or a left-wing progressive acquiescence with that possibility and also with the assumption that anti-semitism doesn't really matter exacerbated by israel i mean enormously exacerbated often by israel um i mean i'll give you another i mean in terms of like seeing those two things together i'm in a film at the moment like i'm I'm doing a voice in a film an animated film called my father's secrets uh, which is a sweet film if it ever comes to australia you know, go and see it. It's a film. Of, it's by from a graphic novel, and it, it's about a guy in Belgium in the 60s and 70s who discovers his dad, having not realised it before, was a Holocaust survivor. Blah. It's a very sweet little film. Anyway, I went on Sky News to talk about it uh, just before it came out a couple of weeks ago, and they asked me about the present situation, and I didn't talk about Gaza. I didn't even talk about the marches in London. I literally just said, yeah, well, the, the Jewish community are living in a quite heightened state of dread and anxiety at the moment. Anti-Semitism's kind of gone through the roof. I mean, it is, like, ridiculous. There's, like, 1,200% more incidents of anti-Semitism in Britain than normal. Uh, and, you know, people are frightened to go into central London and whatever. Uh, and I just really talked about vulnerability, you know, about Jews feeling vulnerable and all, all of us living with a kind of race deja vu about difficult, bad times and whatever. And placing that vulnerability publicly, you might think, well, people might be sympathetic. Just It just led to incredible hate. I mean, incredible hate uh, online. Uh, most of it being about Gaza, most of it being how dare David Badil, you know, claim that the Jewish community is suffering in any way at the moment uh, when people are being bombed in Gaza, which I didn't compare at all. But I think it's also this sense that... that no other, as far as I can make out, no other um, calling, or I, not even calling out here, no other sort of just talking about your sort of insecurity and the ways in which your uh, ethnic identity might be under threat or whatever gets the same fury. It gets an incredible fury, Jews talking about that. Um, that notion of, you know, listening to a minority who are identifying their minority experience it doesn't just not apply to Jews. It leads to extreme anger mm. with Jews. It's so tricky for me because I, I see, I understand that that complaint rhymes with a hysterical persecution complex that you sometimes see from the most reactionary forces in Israel. Like I saw a clip some years ago of these Jewish, these aggressive right-wing settlers who are going in and like burning down Palestinians' uh, fields in the West Bank and making life intolerable for Palestinians and settling illegally on the on land that isn't Israel's. And they're screaming at the camera how, never again, never again, like, you know, our grand, my, my grandparents and great-grandparents were persecuted, but we're not going to let it happen again. We're not going to let them do it to us. 
I'm like, mm. who's the aggressor that's here, not, bro? Well, that's not putting their vulnerability really on show. I don't think that's that's just aggressive. I mean, I guess it's passive aggressive at some level, but uh, it's still, you know, it seems to me. Well, for, again, like it seems to be like I am not beholden if someone asks me a question on TV about what is what is it like being Jewish in Britain at the moment to make it clear that I have to disengage something I say about feeling vulnerable from what a settler might say yes. uh, to claim that their incredibly violent and aggressive behaviour is like inspired by a feeling of not feeling safe. Right, right? and certainly well, no other about... minority would be expected to, to do so. I mean, you wouldn't, if you were talking... Yeah, and what I'm talking yeah. about is that, you know, there's a Jewish school, one of many Jewish schools, uh, that was advising its kids not to wear the blazer at this time because it's got a star of david on it i went to a jewish primary school which had a star of david on it and i remember people from the national front who were right wing you know sh shouting yids at us when we were kids but that doesn't seem as bad as being told you should not wear it at all because you might get attacked on the street uh and just putting that on the table as a like this is quite upsetting and frightening and whatever should not get people saying how dare you how dare you talk about that? Um, unless there's a weird space in which it feels like this is not quite a legitimate thing to talk about. Mm, that's true. And if you, again, transpose it to any other community, I mean, if people were, you know, if, 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 if Indians or Pakistanis were being subjected to racist hostility, then they're describing that wouldn't lead to someone saying, but what about all the things that your community back in South Asia is doing to oppress other people? Well, they're doing, well they're doing it now. I'm sorry. I mean, you know, the, you, you get accused of what a battery for saying this, but I'll say it. Pakistan has just mass deported 200,000, 250,000 Afghan Muslims. Just sent them out of the country. Just mass, there's mass deportations of Muslims, Afghan Muslims from Pakistan going on at the moment. Uh, you know, well, same thing in a way is happening, you know, in Israel, obviously under different circumstances, but the mass dislocation of a Muslim community is happening. L literally, no one really knows about it very much, and certainly there are no marches about it and whatever. So, you know, one of the things that sometimes seems to be the case, I believe Sasha Baron Cohen once said to me, and he's much more militant than I am about Israel, but he once said to me that, you know, people, by which he kind of meant white people, white progressives, are only really worried when Jews are killing brown people they never care about brown people killing brown people uh and or you know discriminating against brown people and that there is some truth in that uh because again this binary of good and bad i think the white progressive looks on say the chinese imprisoning a million uyghurs in camps for re-education and sterilizing women and disappearing large amounts of men and thinks well they're both people of color so it's not really up to us to say anything about that which is weird when, as far as I'm concerned, Israelis are people of colour. You know, I look at them and they don't seem anything like me, to be honest. They, they, they don't. They just seem like, you know, people in this Middle Eastern, foreign land, much more macho than me, you know, having their very angry stuff that they're doing. It's like, you know. And so, but the imposition of whiteness is very strong. David, I want to talk briefly about punching up and punching down, but I want to do so for our premium subscribers. Uh, so to, to listeners to the free podcast, uh, thanks so much for listening. You can get the, the premium subscription at Uncomfortable Conversations. Right, so we leave behind com. the free Yes, do you want to say goodbye that to them? Do you want to say goodbye to them? <laughs> Bye-bye, poor people. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really sorry about, about this. I hope you've enjoyed it so far. <laughs> but we'll earn enough money soon to pay for the premium podcast. You, it, all the Jews who are still listening because they're wealthy, oh, they've yeah. got enough money oh, to pay, but they're also yeah. miserly, so they're probably not paying. Uh, no, that's true. Yeah, so that's a good point. So wrestling with the is the concept of punching up and punching down useful? To hear the rest of this conversation, go to uncomfortableconversations.substack.com/slash/listen, and you will get your own personal premium podcast feed with at least three extra episodes of the podcast every month and heaps of extra stuff including the remainder right now of the fabulous conversation you've just been hearing if it was worth listening to this much of don't rob yourself 
of the rest. Pull out your phone right now and search for Uncomfortable Conversations on the Substack. 